How are you, my friend? Hi, hi. hi. This is Cristiano joining. Cristiano's Christian. here. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Professor Quintini, where are you? You know, he's still operating. He just finished. Oh, good. How was that? Uh, we'll find out. Was a bleeding? We will. Find, or we will no, it's um, <laughs> hypoperfused liver. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so thanks for for joining, joining us. I think uh, Felipe is finishing a case. I Karin is here. Silvio Silvio Nadalin uh, sent me a message. He was doing a liver transplant in a baby, and I think he's almost finishing. He's gonna catch up. Nicholas is here. Professor Jarufi. Hi, hello. 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 Eduardo, we should organize this more often. Seems like everybody's doing a transplant. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Jarufi, you are the big Hi, star Eduardo. of Chile. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, for inviting me. Okay, Hello, we have is, uh, our... Alejandro there. Alejandro Serrano. Alejandro is there. Hola, buenos días. Hola, Alejandro. Alan Hola, Alejandro. Hola, Alejandro. Yes, yes. Buenos días. Let me know if, if Chichi won from Taiwan. Chichi, are, are you here? Who? I don't know if Chichi is what already from Taiwan. Uh, Lucas McCormick from Buenos Aires. Uh, is Lucas. Lucas is not here yet. Uh, Fabio Vester from Porto Alegre. Fabio, where Hello, are you? everyone. Hello. Hola, Fabio. Hi, Fabio. Nice to see everyone. Fabio, thanks. Professor Orlando Torres, the mega star, is here. <laughs> Karin, <laughs> Big Orlando. Karin Orlando. is uh, about to connect. I'm a studio. soldier. <laughs> OK, guys, so I think we, we should start on time. Uh, you know, these, these meetings uh, have been very fruitful uh, for us. We have been learning a lot from these uh, international uh, guests and we have been organizing few uh, Zoom meetings in these new days and it's been very productive. So today we, we are very uh, honored uh, to have maybe, uh, I, you know, Guido Torzilli needs no introduction. He's probably one of the most relevant uh, surgeons for liver surgeons in the whole globe. And uh, his publications and his innovations has been uh, noticed from everywhere in the world. So uh, we have been learning a lot from him. Uh, his papers are just fantastic. His techniques are fantastic. He's, I'm sure he will show us tonight a lot of his uh, work and uh, his technique and his uh, fabulous knowledge in liver surgery. I think Guido is probably the most Japanese uh, Italian surgeon. He has a lot of uh, uh, expertise that he uh, got in Japan. And he used to work uh, a few years with Professor Makushi, so he's uh, very talented, certain. So Guido, uh, you have, you know, as time as much as you need. So thank you very much to accept this invitation. We know that in Milan right now, it's almost midnight and you are a very busy surgeon. So we appreciate your attention. So uh, now you are running the show. Thank you very much. You are too kind. You said too many things about me, which are really not, uh, not corresponding to the reality. I'm just, uh, just someone that has tried to, to proceed in the line that I learned in Japan, trying to make some, you know, Italian addition. <laughs> and uh, I will try to share the slide, the, the, the screen. And then, okay, we can start with the presentation. Is it okay? Can you see it? The screen? No, no. yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. There we go. 
Now okay. you have it. Now, 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 Pido. Okay. It's okay, Eva. It's okay. Uh, can you see the, the hostess? Always checking my token, okay? uh, surveying my token. Uh, complex hepatectomies for colorectal liver medicine is the, the argument that uh, Eduardo has addressed to me. And uh, it's uh, something that. Uh, Okay, this is complexity. This is a, a case with uh, several cysts uh, and in green uh, the metastatic foresight from uh, uh, colorectal cancer. Exactly in this case, there uh, were 35 lesions. And uh, when you see this kind of uh, situation, you have to try to use your fantasy and your expertise to uh, foresee if there is any possibility to offer treat surgical treatment to this patient. And one uh, analogy that uh, could uh, probably better figure out uh, how we consider the liver and how we thought uh, to the, in the sense uh, uh, we wanted to offer in an extreme uh, parenchymal sparing surgery for the patient just to deal with such a complexity in a conservative way. And the analogy is uh, when you look at the liver uh, anatomically, you will see that the liver looks like a, a tree. And uh, it was shown uh, to me in this nice paper by Pietro Maino uh, from Geneva, now is. Uh, in Lugano, but uh, is a pupil of Jim Nenta. And uh, this, this tree was in front of his house, looking at this tree. He had uh, found that it was uh, exactly looking like a, a cast of the liver. And exactly, this is the, a, a cast that I took from the web. Uh, it is even more complex than a tree, because the, uh, you can say that uh, the liver is uh, two trees put together in a uh, 180 degrees uh, among the hepatic vein and the portal branches. And then if you uh, look back to the liver that I showed before, you could see that this is the, the, the virtual cast of that patient with a 35 lesion. And we put 35 lesions into the liver. And we have to offer a solution, Try, starting from this uh, analogy for this patient. And uh, <clears throat> if we think about uh, the conventional kind of uh, uh, approach in the liver, with vertical dissection, major hepatectomy, well, for this patient, you could uh, cut the right or the left, but there is no solution. Uh, even with the stage technique, if you apply the, uh, the, the ALPS or two stage, you have 28% of future liver remnant. Anyhow, you have an R1 resection, and uh, you should do two ablations. Somehow, in this case, which in an extreme case, this kind of approach probably does not work. Then there is probably an emerging new solution because uh, for this patient, in front of the unresectability in the future, and but now actually already, there are several trials, trials that are far in advance uh, recruiting patients, there could be the liver transplantation, and probably in the future, this will be one of the solutions. Uh, and, but what we have uh, started before uh, would have been the solution offered by the liver transplant was a sort of anarchist anatomical resection. What do I mean when I say anarchist anatomical resection? You have the three you find the mainstream, like a sculpture, you find the 
vessel, look here, just a few millimeters under the surface of the liver, we identify immediately one of the branch of the hepatic veins. And this branch is tunnelized with the medicine bound, and we start what is here, shown by the dotted green line. And then you follow the anatomy of the liver, but in, at, at your own uh, modalities. It's a sort of uh, personalized anatomy uh, of the organ. Then uh, you, following this kind of approach, you just enter into the liver, you follow the middle hepatic vein, you arrive there, you find the tumor, you resect the middle hepatic vein, you proceed again in the, uh, with the dissection to go after, uh, to find your finger behind because you have already mobilized the entire liver. And at the end, you will uh, formalize a liver tunnel. With this kind of route into the liver, driven by the end and the dissection and following the vessels. In this way, you are doing a vessel guided hepatectomy. The, to do that, you need to know three aspects which are important. Uh, we name the sculpture formula. You need to know the ultrasound. You need to be familiar with the intraoperative ultrasound, but nowadays I may say that everyone is uh, well equipped in this sense uh, as a personal background and also technological. Indeed, uh, this is the way you can have uh, a liver that becomes transparent. To follow the anatomy, you understand the anatomy before the dissection. I may say that with the expertise, uh, once you will use and you will uh, combine all the, the tactile feeling, the knowledge that you have, and also the, the, the say the, 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 the information that you get from the ultrasound, at the end the ultrasound will not be used so frequently during the operation because uh, it is enough for you to understand where to go and at the end, and I will show you, uh, you will have the relation with the organ that can drive itself where to go in a safe modality. Uh, then once you have uh, this possibility, the organ is become transparent, you select the dissection area and you follow this section that otherwise you could not do. You can surf into the liver above the hepatic vein, like in this case in a transverse modality and even in a vertical modality. And this is the appearance in which we detach the tumor from the middle hepatic vein and in this case transverse vein from the right hepatic vein at this point. Uh, and this is another case in which you see, you see what we figure out as the section, what we realize during the resection, and we pass above the umbilical portion to this section. This is the position in which we were detaching the tumor from the vessel in a resection that is formally unsuitable because you, as you show, as I show in the CT beside the image of the interoperative, uh, the interoperative imaging, uh, in this condition, there would have been a one vascular bilateral, formally unresected, conventionally unresected. Then with this kind of surgery, we named it uh, the roller coaster procedure. The other aspect is uh, to challenge the top, the, to focus uh, about the R1 mini. Well, uh, all of you know that by the literature, the tumor, uh, the, the surgeon get towards the tumor, any kind of tumor, but in particular with the colorectal liver mass, from one, more than one centimeter to one millimeter. And uh, we did this survey among the many surgeons around the world, 52 countries, and uh, by necessity, the R1 was accepted by 53% of the surgeons. So R1 is not a scan. 
Of course, everyone tried to avoid, but it's not a scam. Well, uh, if you look at this three paper, uh, initially it was shown that exposure is a drama. You know, it's really dismal in terms of prognosis, although think about this is 80 months as of so now. Then the memorials of Catherine show that, uh, well, uh, there are long survivors also if there is uh, one resection. And uh, Paul Bruce showed that by NSS can offer uh, option of survival almost similar to the R0 resection. Then there is, as always in the literature, a spectrum of uh, experience that says uh, one thing and the opposite at the same time. Well, what we know is that uh, the best would be R0. Huh? You have to remove this tumor, you can do this resection. This is not good. If possible, you should avoid a one. But how can we classify this kind of resection? Is it still a one as the a one in the parenchymal or not? Uh, well, the hypothesis was this, uh, that uh, the major vessel are border between two countries. Two segments are completely autonomous anatomical units, which are separated by the major vessels. Then cannot be the contact with the major vessel uh, equal to the contact with the parenchyma, because the parenchyma, they are inside the same environment with the vessel, they are in contact with something which is out of. And indeed, the, Based on this assumption, we started detaching systematically the tumor from the vessels. And uh, to enforce our conviction, came this paper recently, uh, 2017. It was published for another reason, reality, to justify, the, to, to give more rationality to the Takazaki procedure, not the, the secret of the pedicles at the hepatic ion, which is nowadays more popular with the advent of the laparoscopic approach. But at the end, what's, what was said in this, uh, in this uh, paper? was said that uh, there is another uh, layer dividing the parenchyma from the vessel, not only the vessel wall, but also the lenic, lenic capsule, if, which was well known since long time, but the surgeon probably forgot this aspect. And this aspect motivated uh, a further defense of the vessel wall against the, the invasion of the tumor. The vessel wall inside the liver is separated from the parenchyma, like in the fact also the inferior vena cava. Then, if we detach the inferior vena cava, we can detach also the hepatic vessel. And indeed, <coughs> we uh, consider the possibility to define this kind of R1 in a different manner, the R1 vascular, because there is the rational at the very least. Uh, and uh, the initial experience uh, showed that uh, the results were encouraging. We could uh, detach at this point the tumor instead of resecting the vessel and then avoid major resection. This was published in Epidogastroenterology. Of course, it was a prospective court without comparison, but at the end was a flash of the idea of the R1 vascular that was entering in our research. And at the end, after several years, we have published the first one about the colorectum, and then after we have published other three papers about SEC, mass forming, and we will see about focusing just on the patrocaval confluence for the colorectal. Well, if you look at the colorectal liver meds, the L1 vascular behave like the R0 in terms of a per patient and per section area local recurrence. With a median follow up of 33 months, uh, the consistent number of patients, 226 and 627 resection areas. Well, the L1 parenchyma behave uh, worse, you know, so it's not acceptable, should be avoided. And in terms of survival, the R1 vascular patient received uh, better survival, despite this patient had, of course, more complex condition than the R1 that has. And focusing, just as I said, with the pathocardial confluence, which motivates most of the time major hepatectomy, 
Well, you will see that the systematic detachment led us to spare without any reconstruction 50% of the patient, 32 just received the partial resection and only 2% received the patient. And then at the end, uh, we had uh, hepatic vein sparing uh, in 107 patients with a local recurrence of 6%. Then in this way, you can really, you know, you remember the roller coaster, follow the vein, detach the tube, you can embrace with the dissection the organ and remove, detach all the region, even they are, they are scattering in, in deep in ter, in, inside the, the, the organ. Then at the end, we can say that the red line is only for the R1 parenchyma, and the green line, uh, the R1 vascular deserves the green line. We, we can uh, proceed with the detachment. And the last aspect of the formula is not the curriculum vitae, eh, but the communicating vein. The communicating vein means uh, once, sometimes you have, well, you have to anyway, anyway uh, reject the vessel. But curiously, in this series, we did a major hepatectomy only 0.7%, despite uh, 28 patients had hepatic vein resection. 16% of the patient. Why? Because once there is the impossibility to, to say, to spare the vessel, means that there is a restriction of the vessel. And the vessel restricted induced the liver to develop the, the, the rescue uh, chanting uh, vascular pattern, which is the, uh, represented by the communicative vein. In this case, this is the liver tunnel. We reject the media but not this part of the liver. This is the arch. And uh, you see that the middle hepatic vein is communicating with the right hepatic vein. This is the reconstruction of several scans of the ultrasound. But there is a nice and more than one communication in between. In this way, you open a new scenario in the possibility that you can have in doing liver surgery. At the end, with the, the, the the contact and the presence of the communicating vein, you can maximize, really maximize, the rate of parenchymal sparing that you can offer for a patient. And then also the, uh, the possibility to operate this patient. You have, with this combination of three aspects, the possibility of uh, offering infinite solution because you have infinite plane into the liver to follow. You don't have any more than just the three main uh, the, the hepatic vein or even the glissonian fissure, but anyhow, you have infinite plane. You just have to follow the vessel as you follow uh, uh, into the tree, uh, the part of the tree that uh, you want to uh, follow and to present the part that you want to remove. We now can consider the idea of changing the, con the concept of hepatectomy. Because, because uh, you have, uh, and so luckily it was accepted on uh, Anna's surgery in this paper, in which uh, we showed, uh, uh, we tried to classify the hepatectomy according to the outcome. And for us, it was the way to insert also operation that we were promoting with the vessel resection and uh, the spelling of the parenchyma up to the liver tunnel represented by this picture. Uh, and uh, this kind of procedure proved also in that paper to be safe, to be safer than a major hepatectomy, performing better than in terms of morbidity and uh, liver failure, the green is the, are the complex limited and the complex core hepatectomies, complex code is the tunnel, complex limited are those resections with uh, hepatic vein but without removal of the parenchyma, total removal of the parenchyma, thera theoretically trained, I mean seven and seven, seven and eight uh, together with the right hepatic vein is pairing the five and the six. Well, all this procedure performed better than a major hepatectomy in terms of uh, morbidity, uh, liver failure, only the bile leaves. Uh, is worsened because, of course, the complex core hepatectomy, represented in example by the uh, tunnel, uh, is, of course, uh, somehow 
uh, more risky in this sense. And but you have also to consider one thing: the uh, tunnel. There are less than 100 cases every ever done in the literature. Why the right hepatectomy is uh, a much more standardized procedure, and that also this conclusion should be reconsidered in the time according to the uh, progress of the experience and the diffusion of this kind of medication from the centers. Well, uh, how do we do? How should you do? No, how could you do this kind of procedure? Uh, this is what I'm saying is uh, not what should be done, but uh, it's just to show that uh, you do not de need any exact, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated technology. The most sophisticated technology is your brain and your hands. Uh, we use Pringle and we show that we can uh, use Pringle long time in a safe manner. It was published in 2012, even in cirrhotic patients, 35% with more than two hours were cirrhotics. And uh, these are the uh, profiles of the virulent level uh, ALT and uh, ASD, uh, according with the, in the green from one hour to two hours, and the, with the red uh, arrow, uh, the curve of those who receive more than two hours up to 348 minutes, which is still now the length, the, the, the longer gap, of course, intermittent, ever done in the research. Uh, and technologi technologically, you can do this operation with these two instruments. Of course, you can use user, you can use whatever you want. But this operation can be done with very simple technology. Then, paradoxically, can be done in every part in the world, whenever you have the expertise and the medical background to offer the assistance to the patient. But technologically, you need uh, just a medicine bound and the crash clamp. Nowadays, we are, uh, you know, we use the Liga Shure also, but this can be done of this patient, that patient was done without any energy device. I'm not against, but uh, it can be done also in this way. And uh, I mean, the standard of reference is that technology, the crash clamping and the medicine. This is the standard of reference. Probably with equal result with the other, but depends on your condition, it is acceptable to you. Is it reproducible? Well, this is the histogram that is showing the activity of my staff uh, nowadays. And the blue are the operation done by me. And uh, of course, it's decreasing. Uh, they are operating the, the complexity, almost the same complexity I am operating. And for those who have visited us, this can be confirmed because they saw my staff operating. And uh, then it can be learned and it can be, it, it has to be teaching to the, to the younger. Of course, it's a stepwise path. You start with a relatively complex but simple, more complex like the tunnel, and very complex like uh, suspending the vein removing the lesion behind, you know, navigating inside the liver, sparing the P58 above the right hepatic vein, which is here behind, and the P58 dorsal is a sort of bridge over the right hepatic vein. This sophistication is uh, uh, something that you will learn once uh, you fill the liver yourself with uh, the dissection, with the feedbacks that you have, with the expertise, and then at the end, you do this kind of navigation, which is well represented in the case that I showed there just before the CT with the touch one vessel. We go under the axilla of the right hepatic vein, we go up the touch and reconstruct and remove the tumor. And at the end, in this patient, you have the liver tunnel, the dissection, the resection of the, the suture of the right hepatic vein, the suture again of the right hepatic vein and everything is inside to allow the selective uh, removal of the tumor, sparing at maxim, maximizing the sparing of the liver parenchyma. And an example is the, the, the 
the route to the tunnel. I started with the mini mesopatectomy, which was published on Anderson Surgery in 2010. The mini mesopatectomy was shifting a, a, a central hepatectomy to a limited resection, just taking profit with the, uh, with the, of the communicating vein. That's this operation, removing the major hepatic A, normally should receive a major hepatectomy, just a limited resection. Uh, <clears throat> from the limited resection, and this is the schema. Well, we move to the, we get deep for those lesions who can invade also the first segment one, not only the segment data for superior resection. And then you could do a resection selectively once you have a tumor trapped between the middle, the right hepatic and the VA dorsal, inferior vena cava, and a, a big tumor, so not suitable for a selective resection of segment one. And then at the end, you can mobilize the liver, free, uh, uh, you know, let yourself uh, guide with the fingertip the dissection, follow the dissection, drive the dissection, and in, in the fact, remove the tumor free the tumor from the region in which it was. And at the end, we resect also the middle hepatic vein when needed. This is a case in which there is the detachment and also the sacrifice of the vessel and spare because of the communicative. And these are operations done, tunnel by several surgeries in the world that follow. This is showing that Extra surgeon can do that without major problem. How did the work form the, the formula work critically for the complexity? For the complexity, uh, we can resect, in, uh, resect the resectable in a single session. This is a patient with 38 lesions removed in a single operation. There is a tunnel, there is detachment, the there is, and you know, we identify the cluster of the tumor and uh, focus our attention to remove the cluster of the tumor. And this is the series up to July 29, uh, to, uh, 2019, uh, 4 to 49 lesion, 10% only of the patient had the major hepatectomy. The mortality was 0.8%, only three patients. Notably, uh, the contact was present in 72% uh, uh, of the patient, in bilaterally 32%. And more than 10 lesions were present in 38%. And uh, notably also, the liver-only liver resection uh, was uh, uh, liver recurrence. The world, liver patient with liver-only liver recurrence were re-resected in 61% of them. Because if you spare the, 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 the skeleton of the organ, you have that the next the same opportunity to reoperate the patient because you have the same freedom degree according to the presence of all the vessels that you preserve. While if you, you do an amputation of the organ, you will not have the same solution. And nowadays we can standardize the procedure because, because nowadays with the virtual cast, we can uh, estimate accurately the future liver value in complex condition, with complex dissection pain, otherwise unsuitable with the other method. And in this case, it was exactly mimicking what we found. It was 673, it was 637 milliliter with the detachment of all the vessel according to our standard technique. The recurrence, if, as I said, if you preserve the skeleton of the organ, you can reoperate. This is a case we received a one stage procedure for multiple bilobar at 12 lesions, the second operation. Then we were uh, in condition to remove and to clear all the liver. Again, uh, we, in, look, there is a tunnel between the middle and the left, and we want to preserve even the, the segment two. For us, the left lobectomy, segment two and three, is very rare. We want to spare at any time any parenchyma because it may be useful for the future. For this patient, the risk of recurrence is very high. And the disappearing lesion, well, 
Now we have the technology. It's a simple, relatively simple technology, just the ultrasound. You combine the ultrasound with the, the tracer and the, on the screen of the ultrasound, you upload, in this case, the pre-chemo CT with the visible lesion, and you match the ultrasound with the pre-chemo CT. You identify in the cast all the lesion, and it was removed uh, 12, 18 C, uh, colorectal uh, metastasis removed at once. Uh, this was a live demo in 2015 in Ewald, but we arrived to remove a similar situation for 33 lesions in a patient, which is the maximum up to now. And uh, we, of course, uh, this kind of formula, uh, formula uh, the, the question is, did it uh, work uh, versus other approaches? In, uh, in particular, two stage hepatectomy in the Alps. Well, uh, we challenged uh, Paul Bruce, uh, two stage hepatectomy versus us. The criteria for the study were dictated by uh, the Paul Bruce. Uh, I asked the criteria for which in your institution you do compulsory uh, uh, two stage hepatectomy. Then we uh, extrapolate the two series and we match the patient with similar condition and we saw how they were behaving after surgery with one stage in the humanitas and two stages in Paul Bruce. And of course, we don't have the dropout on the intention to treat uh, survival. The all one stage, of course, perform better. They are also safer. We are only 0.8% of mortality. And if you compare the two series according to another last. Is it real that the two-stage procedure uh, in the fact select the best patient? Probably not, because we do not select any one of them. The patients are exactly the same, similar, but uh, we do an operation at once. We do not select, so we do not have a dropout. Despite that, the recurrence free survival is exactly the same. That it means that probably with the two stages you really do not exclude the worst patient. But probably you exclude some patients that can receive the operation with another kind of approach. And uh, recently we were challenged by the uh, Italian registry of ALPS. So it means 12 centers challenged our center. And uh, curiously, we dictated the degree of complexity. We want every, every patient of our series should have had a a uh, major relation with a major vessel. This was not achievable in the Alps, despite at the end we accepted a one to two matching, one from the 12 center, two patients from the single center. Anyhow, it means that Alps was abused because it was used for a complexity which is clearly lower than the complexity that we are operating. We are using two, and the mortality, of course, it was much lower. Uh, and uh, the R0 rejection, of course, was in favor of the Alps, but as I said, R1 vascular is more than acceptable. Uh, and I'm moving to the, uh, to the end. Any further advancement, then, well, we are, we are now challenging, as I said, the bilateral R1 vascular. So it means the formally unresectable patient. The R1 vascular can be done bilaterally, and the results are encouraging. This is the case, otherwise I have with the colorectal units at the cover conference and over the portable rotation with the, the, the contact uh, with bilateral vessels. Well, it was an upper transverse, and this is the resection at the end, which have entirely delivered, thanking to the communicating vein, removing two or the three hepatic vessels. Or a, a tumor like this, there were 12 metastases. This is the major one in the segment one, uh, exactly you know, in contact with the inferior vena cava, with the cover confluence, with lodging the two hepatic vein. You cannot see the middle hepatic vein. And of course, there is contact uh, at 360 degrees. Uh, for similar, even smaller condition, the ex vivo in situ is proposed. Well, for this condition, we did a liver tunnel. This is a dissection. We, we remove selectively the organ, the tumor. 
reconsidering, this is the last challenge, the future liver ran limits. Why? If you think that you can uh, surf into the organ, the touching the tumor, uh, touching the tumor from the major vessel, but sparing the architecture of you may consider possible to uh, to give a different uh, kind of regeneration of the organ because uh, the, we, we observe that the liver regenerates more in a milder way, in a more physiological way, probably because if you spare the vessel, the regeneration is more uh, physiological rather than by the amputation. Then you see you can uh, scare all the surface of the organ, keeping the core only of the organ. This is a major hepatectomy in a conservative way. It's a paradox, but probably it's something that can be implemented that we are in, uh, in the way of doing that. And here is another example. Look, the yellow line, if we surround the organ, yeah, we reappear here and we do this section in this way everywhere to offer a new kind of. And I conclude with the case that we were looking at initially with the 35 vision. You can do the anarchist sculpture procedure. This is the cast, virtual cast before the operation. This is what we did. These are the dissection line accordingly. And this are the dissection. Here is there is a tunnel to remove a lesion here. This is another detachment here to spare these two vessels that permit us to leave this part of the liver with these two vessels, inflow and this outflow representative by the middle part. And this is the cast of the organ with the removal of 35 lesions in a single procedure. The vessel guided the protector. <coughs> Any concern? This is the last slide. I have only one concern for, for the younger. I think that this effort deserves still uh, stabilization in a, and standardization in an open approach because there is no technology, no uh, capability, and I think uh, it's uh, too challenging to do that in the minimal invasive surgery. Uh, I think that we have co to consider that uh, minimal, in, minimal access liver surgery is a kind of uh, new way of incision. As there was the thoracophrenal laparotomy, the midline incision, now there is the, also this. And every kind of incision has its own degree of uh, complexity to, to face with. But if we do not consider this aspect, we assume that we have to privilege the incision. I am afraid that we will offer technology. Yeah, we can do this with the sculpture, the medicine bound, and whatever. Of course, if you want CUSA, Ligash, uh, every, every energy device that you want, but please do not use the energy device to come back to the right protector. If suitable, this, I think, is the future for the patient of liver surgery. Otherwise, uh, I really do not understand if I see a case like this one, simple, offer uh, a minimal access liver surgery ALPS for two operations, and this patient, a single operation with removal of all diseases in a really minimal invasive liver surgery, but one stage and with a thoracophenol around it. Where is the advancement for the patient? Thank you very much. Is there someone out? Guido, <clears throat> thank you very much. That that was uh, 
a phenomenal talk as usual. But you know, this is uh, you you show very complex operation. This one of the papers you wrote a few years ago. You call this as a cherry pick operation when you're trying, you know, to remove a lot of uh, nodules. Uh, but this is not easy. Sometimes uh, looks to me that do, doing a formal hepatectomy is much easier to do this tunnel operation or cherry pick operation. Uh, I think we have some. We have a lot of debaters. I have a question, but I will I will make make this question at the end. I will obviously start uh, with the Brazilians, so uh, I will uh, get the privilege to to ask Professor Orlando to make the a question and comment, and then we move to Professor uh, Fabio Vester, and then we go to the other foreigners. Please, Orlando. Thanks, Eduardo. Professor Guido, as usual, very, very nice talk, fantastic presentation, nice slides. I spent some days in, in Humanity Hospital with you, and I, when I came back to Brazil, I tried to do some technique of, like I used to, to call, Torzilli approach. So, I agree with Eduardo that it is a complex procedure. I have a few questions for you related to communicating veins. Uh, my first question is, uh, communicating vein is a response of the occlusion of the vein by the tumor, or you can identify communicating vein respective of the tumor in the occlusion vein? Because Some I, I'm yeah, sorry. because I think it, how often do you identify in communication vein? So the, in the case we want to spare the rest, we cannot spare the rest because the detachment is unsuitable. Almost all of the patients have the communicating vein. The first paper we uh, found 80%, but nowadays with more skillful uh, experience and uh, uh, in particular with a better preoperative imaging in which you can see it uh, very clearly um, in most of the cases. Uh, well, the number of patients in which uh, there are uh, is uh, very high. In the, in the only condition uh, in the cirrhotic patient is uh, lower. The because of the fibrotic liver probably, you know, counteract the attempt of the liver to find out to open the shunting vein. The shunting vein in the cast has been proven to be around 40% uh, of cases of normal liver without any tumor. So they exist normally. Indeed, were initially used in the living donor liver transplant. To, you know, we just moved this uh, this kind of uh, uh, finding that have uh, promoted and uh, uh, the use of uh, the, 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 the existence of the communicating vein. It was done by the group of Makuchi in 2004 by Sano about uh, the sparing of the middle hepatic vein or not in living donor liver transplantation. Uh, what we did, it was just to uh, to to move it uh, in, the, in the executive surgery, and uh, it works. Um, to find it, uh, like, well, we have to study before. There are there is a semiology of the short hepatic vein, the communicative vein. Is the angle in which uh, the vest, the, the vein enter in the major trunk of the hepatic vein. Normally, it's more than 45 degrees. It's uh, more, uh, you know, more vertical. Não por quatro, não dormi. Não jantou ainda. Another, another question is related to tunnel operation. I see it's a complex operation. You you decide to ligate the three hepatic vein, right hepatic vein, mid hepatic vein and left hepatic vein during the procedure. 
and how how big in terms of size of the accessory right apart vein, Makushi vein, to to the site of resection of the right middle and left apartment vein. It's necessary no. a huge Makushi vein. No, no, no. The tunnel is not the resection uh, of the three apartment vein. The tunnel is just the resection of the middle apartment vein with uh, the detachment of the tumor from the right and the, and the left is the tunnel. But uh, uh, there is uh, some, we have done three cases of total upper transversal patrectomy, what we call total upper transversal, in which we remove uh, the roof of the organ, the three hepatic vein, and, but in this condition means that the hepatic vein are almost obstructed. You know, once you plan this kind of operation, you do the preoperative imaging. We used to do CT and MRI. MRI with the EOB. And uh, there are two features that warranty you the existence, even if you do not see the vessel. The existence of the communicating vein is the enhancement of the uh, hepatospecific contrast medium, which, if it is homogeneous, it means that it is well perfused and the outflow works. And secondly, the, uh, the existence of uh, the the possibility to see the, the, the hepatic vein preoperative. In this way, we can plan, in a standard manner, the, uh, the total uh, upper transversal hepatic vein. And of course, in this condition, there should be the inferior right hepatic vein, the thick one. But if there would not be the vein, the patient would never arrive to you because it means that the liver has no outflow. The patient died without operation because of liver failure. If the patient come in your outpatient, means that the outflow works. Just take profit of this fact. The natural did his work, and then we can, you know, it is like the guillotine. You cut the head of the liver, but the liver has the escape with another vein, for sure. The inferior right, it works. And then you have two bridge from the middle, from the left to the middle, and from the middle to the right, and to the, from the right to the, to the inferior right. And then you have a, a fantastic chain of uh, communicating brain that it was useful for us in three cases. It is very it's rare. My, because it is rare my, my, because it is rare that the patient comes to the outpatient. It is, you know, depending exactly by the existence of the inferior right My My final question, Professor, is, is about, and I saw you doing a thoracal frenal laparotomy for a tumor located in the roof of the liver, like segment, segment eight, for example. When to decide for, for this procedure and not the complication related to to do a thoracic frenal laparotomy. We have published a paper about uh, the thoracic frenal laparotomy in, co in comparison with the patient without, uh, and there is not, uh, there are no uh, major morbidity in tissue. In some patients, but the vast minority, we have to do, uh, you know, to drain the pleural effusion. But normally, the pleural effusion happens also after any kind of uh, supramesocolic uh, major surgery, no? as a reaction. And uh, the, the, the problem that we have is the management of the pain sometimes, and it depends on the anesthesiologist and the protocol that we have. And every time they change the anesthesiologist, the, the, the chief of the anesthesiology department, uh, we have to reset and uh, this is the, the moment in which we have a new chief uh, uh, that is also the hero of the COVID, but anyway, the pain has not uh, so high familiarity. So we have to discuss with them to reschedule the way of uh, they control the, the pain. We use the thoracophrenal laparotomy when? When we have to enter with the left hand behind the liver and control the direction of the dissection. 
and it's important. It's really important if you want to do uh, a dissection uh, which uh, does not drive you in the wrong uh, path. You know, at the, uh, the fourth tunnel I did, by mistake, I reject the right posterior portal branch. Um, and it, because at a certain point in the tunnel, you are like if you have the, your head, uh, you know, completely 180 degrees. Uh, the, the, the frontal become the posterior and the posterior become the frontal. And then you can be confused. And at a certain point, uh, at that time, uh, luckily we were able to shift the patient in a two-stage approach because we have to extend the resection to the right posterior and then we have no volume enough and then we conclude the operation in a second time with the left side of the But uh, this uh, is because uh, it's a difficult geometry. Once you have uh, the expertise enough and you have uh, done the proper incision that let you comfortably enter and behind the liver and drive in a proper way the dissection and you know the landmark, it's a safe person. But you need all the facility. If you want to do a tunnel like you are doing a right hepatectomy, it's a disaster. Thanks, Professor. I'm going to talk to Professor Eduardo Fernandes Jonathan. Eduardo. Thanks, Orlando. Uh, let me invite Professor Vester. Professor Vescher from Porto Alegre, please, Fabio. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to, to be here with Professor Torzilli. I have a, a huge admiration for his work. And uh, I say everyone, every time that Professor Torzilli represents one of the, the best surgeons that we that, uh, see that show the Japanese technique of liver surgeries because the Western way to, to perform liver surgery is different. The comparison of the liver surgery for, the, for us, for the Western surgeries, uh, for, the, for the liver surgeries is different. And uh, me and Eduardo have uh, said that uh, to understand the liver surgeon from the Japanese technique, we have to understand the Takazaki anatomy and the line capsule then if you don't understand this, you don't understand this kind of surgeries that you have uh, shown for, uh, for us. That is very brilliant, is very, very interesting. And uh, this show also a different way to, to go in, uh, in nowadays for the liver surgery. Why I say this? Because uh, today we speak about Liver, uh, liver transplantation for colorectal liver metastasis and uh, also uh, ALPS. And the majority of time, we don't need the ALPS and we don't need also the liver transplantation. And I'm a very I am very enthusiastic for this, for the liver transplant and for the ALPS also. But I believe in your way, in your philosophy that you have to spare the parenchyma for the for the colorectal liver metastasis, then I ask you for uh, two aspects. The first one is how do you con or or do you control or how do you control the liver function during your resection? You perform during your resection any kind of liver function control as a uh, green indocianin uh, measures. Uh, and the second question. Where, where is your limit for the liver resection for colorectal metastasis? Uh, you believe that we have a space, we have a place for uh, a liver transplant for uh, colorectal liver metastasis, even at the end of the, your resections? Thank you very much for the, for the questions that are very provocative, I may say. Um, <laughs> During the resection, we do not sample uh, the blood for the liver function in the ICC. Uh, I tell you a story. When I came back from Japan, uh, now is 20 years ago, uh, I was in a rural hospital. 
and I have no facility. And uh, the staff were not happy that I came back and wanted to leave a surgery in the hospital. Then nobody wants to buy even the lemon, you know, to, to sample the ICC. Of course I wanted, because I was pupil of Then I had to devise a new kind of system with just the blood uh, sample that you, you get uh, from the routine. And then we devised a flow chart with the calling esterase, and uh, nowadays the fibers. And we are now a faction with that wheels. We have safe and good results, and it works. What we are measuring during the operation is the, the concentration of lactacidemia and the pH. And uh, when it is uh, getting, uh, the pH is going down, uh, the acidosis starts, we prolong the, we stop the operation for a while, we prolong the interval in between. And this is work. It, it, this works, but this emphasizes uh, the important role, fundamental role on an expert anesthesiologist. I may say that we need uh, a subspeciality of anesthesiologists for liver surgery. And uh, uh, we have to convince uh, the powerful guy of the anesthesiological community, which are reluctant. They are very reluctant, as usual, always. The first reaction is, we don't need, we, you know, uh, yeah. in a stupid way, because it's a way of growing culturally, you know, if they would accept. And it is also a field of interesting uh, research, if they would uh, be willing to do so. Uh, then, uh, you know, we have had uh, uh, three deaths in the one stage, and uh, all of them were due to the unbalance of the metabolic imbalance of the patient, for the long operation. And it was always in summertime when there were the anesthesiologists. Nowadays, when I am operating in summertime, I check if there is an anesthesiologist that has expertise. I don't want there is an anesthesiologist that is coming from the orthopedic surgery to, uh, to make, uh, to run the anesthesiology of the liver surgery. Otherwise, it's a disaster. Despite your technique, the patient risks to die. The second question was the liver transplant. I may say that nowadays in Italy, Mazzaferro is running a study, uh, with a multicentric study, and I am one of the members of the board that check if the patient should be resected or transplanted. Because they asked me to, since the, you know, I pushed the, the resection. I may say that I am culturally enthusiastic about the possibility of the transplant. Because the results are, I, I sent to the transplant already three patients. We do not do resection if we cannot save any part of the liver. You know, we spare the liver parenchyma, but we need to find the cluster, the concentration of the nodule. If you cannot figure out any cluster, you cannot offer surgery to the patient because the only solution is not even any stage procedure. The solution is the transplant. And it works because the patient that we sent, you know, they have a good outcome, despite they were completely full of tumor into the heart, scattered everywhere. So I think the transplant is, a, but you know, I'm not saying anything new. There are the people of the Norwegian. Yeah, but you believe, do you believe that after two, three or four resections, complex resections, do you believe that have places for liver transplant after some resections? If you don't have more parenchyma, or you believe could that be. you have the problem, I think, that it's good. I think that it could be. It could be. It could be after surgery. Of course, it could be. You know, as we can re-resect a patient, it can be also transplanted. It's surgery. You know, uh, yeah. if we can reoperate a patient, it is possible also to dismantle the liver and substitute with another. I think there is, uh, of course, more probably difficulty, but nowadays it's too early to recommend this kind of, there is no, but in the future it will be. Okay, thank you, Guido. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Guido, uh, I will be the last Brazilian to, to uh, make some questions, and I will be more provocative. Uh, so, I, have, I haven't seen your presentation any anatomical resections. So uh, all your cases that you present was uh, 
non-anatomical. It means that uh, you don't have uh, specific anatomic landmarks. You are going uh, through the liver, but you are not following any ischemic line, right? Pretty much those operations, it's not like when you do a formal hypotectomy that you, you have the, the, the ischemic line and you just follow the line. So it's, it's not easy uh, you know, to control the bleeding and you don't know exactly where you are. So you may have some ischemic problem in some parts of the liver. And also biliary leak that, you know, you were showing the, the vessels, the, 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 the veins, but the biliary system, you know, it's a little bit different than the veins. So I think those cases, uh, you might have more biliary leak than a formal hypotech. So this is, I wanna hear your comments on this. And the other, the other point is there are a few papers that came out recently about the improved survival in patients with KRS, uh, the, the mutated uh, KRS. Uh, doing anatomic resection, we can have uh, improved survival. So I wanna hear uh, your comments on this. And uh, my last provocative comment is, uh, when we have, you have, you show the case of 38 lesions. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe that, you know, the patient can have 42, not only 38. I think in those kind of uh, resections, you probably will miss uh, one or two or four lesions that you are not seeing that inside the liver. Because if they are very tiny, you're not gonna recognize that on the ultrasound. So I, my personal opinion, think that liver transplant has a hole in those cases that they have multiple bilobar uh, lesions throughout the liver. You're probably gonna miss some liver if you just you know, do cherry pick uh, procedures. Uh, Besides the fact that you showed the, the, the recurrence were pretty uh, good, that uh, over 50%, if I'm not wrong. So let me know when you do anatomical resections. Okay, we have to consider what we consider anatomical resection. When you say anatomical resection, you see right hepatectomy, left hepatectomy, uh, uh, right anterior, right posterior. Is this anatomical or yeah. a segmentectomy? Well, this is a formal anatomical research. Ah. I would say. Well, uh, I you know, I was showing and I called. Uh, can you see the slides again or not? You see my screen? No. Yeah. You see my screen? You. Not, not the slides. Uh, because uh, I show a slides uh, in which uh, I was. The, you know, defining our resection, the anarchist anatomical resection. We are doing a perfectly anatomical resection, but it's a different way of considering the root to the anatomical resection, five millimeter. If you follow the patina, you have the left hand, we are perfectly anatomical. When I do a tunnel, I follow, as I show, the vessel. I show that I follow the patty vein, I follow the Lissonian pedicle and you remove. So we do exactly an anatomical resection. More anatomical than a right hepatectomy <laughs> because we detach and expose all the vessel. Detach the vessel. We do not sacrifice the vessel. So the, the liver is, you know, there is something bluish in the border, two, three millimeter, one centimeter, but no, no, nothing more. So it's a way of doing an anatomical resection. And let me say, uh, when I read the paper of anatomical resection segmentectomy, the Western count, I have seen several times the surgeon that decide this is segment seven, this is segment eight, and how disclose segment seven or segment eight, draw according to the book two vertical square uh, dissection line to show this is segment seven, which is never segment seven, because the border of segment seven and segment, we use, if we want to do an anatomical resection formally for the XCC, for the hepatocellular carcinoma, we use the compression, 
you bluish the liver and you have the, the, the demarcation perfectly. Now we inject also the ICC and you see the dark part is the tumor, is the segment, exactly the segment that you have to remove. But uh, there is, uh, I mean, this is the compression is the strict anatomic resection. Chapman is one. The Western side, forgive me, but most of the resection are not anatomical in my perspective. You have to expose any time the middle hepatic vein if you do a right hepatectomy. If not, it's not an anatomical. Then we expose always the vessel. We, the, 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 it's not a cherry picking. We name now the vessel guided because we want to achieve the vessel. And the vessel drives us to remove whatever we want. Anarchist, because we every time invent a new kind of dissection that connect the plane of the hepatic vein and the glissonian pedicle that we want to spend. So it's a really, you know, surfing around in, into the organ, exactly taking profit of its anatomy. The, the, the most exciting aspect of this surgery is exactly that, that you follow and navigate inside the organ, like, you know, following the vessel. And, you know, trust me, once you do that, I, I saw Professor Mapucci once doing an operation, several years, I was just like there initially, and I couldn't understand what he was doing. Now I completely understand what he was doing. He was navigating in the organ. He does not need any ultrasound because he passed the key. You know, every one of us, when he's driving a car, initially is taking care of everything and is confused. But at the end, when you drive the car, you think about your vacation, your operation and whatever, and you drive. Now you navigate into the liver in this way. You must take care. But, you know, it's really exciting. It's really exciting. It's exciting, I mean, it's not a... But it's exciting because you can really foresee something that otherwise you could not even imagine. And I try to convince the people just move, go in this direction. I show a lot of pictures in which there was full anatomy. One picture in, in which there was the suspended middle hepatic vein, the dorsal branch of P8 passing above the right hepatic vein in which I was we exposed the distal and the hepatocaval part. What is more than anatomy than this? We exposed all the vessels. Of course, it was exactly perfused. The last patient, the, the 35 leaves, we left a slice of the liver, not to sacrifice this, and this slice of the liver had the two P8 dorsal and the middle hepatic vein, perfectly perfused. This is anatomical resection. So basically, you don't change your transaction or you don't change your, your operation based on the KRAS. If it's mutator or wild type, for you, it's the same. You, you don't want to do a little bit more aggressive if it's... Uh, no, we just do the operation. If, if the patient responded to the chemo, we offer surgery. Of course, the, 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 the prognosis is worse, but uh, it's, it's more than us. Okay, so now let's move. We have uh, two, uh, 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 Cristiano is a fake American. He's actually Italian. <laughs> I will invite uh, my dear friend Cristiano Quintini. Now he's in Cleveland. And tr Cristiano is a transplant surgeon and he is also doing HPB. And I, I would suggest him to provoke you also in the, in the mind setting of liver transplantation. Cristiano, please. Uh, I, that, this is always a great Guido, uh, it's a lot of fun, and um, I, um, just two months ago, a, a tree fell into my home, so as you were speaking about trees, I was thinking, you know, retrospectively, maybe the year before, I should have cut the tree rather than trimming it, but, um, uh, which means that sometimes uh, uh, transplant is, uh, is potentially, um, the way to go and and as uh, 
as we navigate and understand which one are the good patients or the bad patients, I have a few technical questions for you. So, uh, you, uh, Guido, you described the uh, um, uh, R1 vascular. And um, so, uh, in your experience, is uh, uh, when the vein is infiltrated, is it the same as when the um, pedicle is infiltrated? In other words, do we treat the pedicle differently when you have, uh, when you foresee R1, then you treat the vein differently because the communication uh, and the, you know, it's a little different because obviously you have bile duct, uh, that you, you know, you could transect and then there is no collaterals. So this is my first question. Uh, of course, uh, if you have uh, the contact and infiltration with the pedicle, you cannot, uh, there are no, no communicating veins, uh, then you have to sacrifice. And uh, what we use is to foresee the, the risk, uh, uh, just uh, the only criteria that we have uh, preoperatively is uh, the dilation, mild dilation of the bile duct. If there is a mild dilation, even mild, of the bile duct, we schedule the resection of the pedicle. Um, so if, if not, you know, we challenge the you just, uh, if there's no dilatation, you preserve the bile duct and you transect the artery and the vein? No, 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 no. If we, if there is infiltration, we do not preserve the bile duct. We cut all the entire Blissonian pedicle. I may say, I, I say, if, uh, I mean, if uh, the tumor is not detachable by the Blissonian pedicle, we try to resect it. If we are in the condition because, uh, in example, you are at the end of the dissection after removal of a lot of other parts and cluster, and you need to preserve that vessel. Of course, uh, we detach and we, I mean, curettage of the of the Bisonian and uh, uh, burning the, the surface. But of course, this is an extreme solution. If suitable, we reset the Bisonian pedicle. If it is not, the touch. Okay, that's my first question. The second question is: um, so, uh, when you when you have a very fatty livers, uh, obese patients or patients have sustained a major chemotherapy damage, uh, how does that affect your ability to perform the operations that you described to us? Because sometimes even clamping in very fatty livers, even clamping for a uh, for two, three, four cycle of Pringles, uh, you know, I've seen enzymes going to three, four thousand. So, do you treat those patients differently? Uh, I may say that uh, this is one, uh, you know, in my team there is Viganol that is always uh, focusing on the, the damage of the chemo. Uh, and I uh, asked him to, to analyze our series because, of course, we have blue liver, steatotic liver. Most of the patients receive a uh, median, the median number of courses of the patient uh, of the one stage procedure is nine, so it is uh, quite a lot because most marginal, most of the patients are considered unresectable a priori by the oncologist. I may say that this patient escaped the oncologist, and uh, in this condition, I may say the mortality. So clinically, we do not have any evidence of difference, uh, but we always keep the remnant liver at least 40%. We do not go below, never. And then, uh, the, thank you. And then a couple of other quick questions. So one is, uh, how do you calculate vol remnant volumes in, uh, in this complex uh, uh, section? Because uh, uh, with the formal hepatectomies, the transaction line is very reproducible in the preoperative uh, uh, settings. But when you do your uh, the procedure, seems like you're you're flying, uh, you're making your move uh, on the fly. You're not really following a specific. Uh, uh, so how do you how do you make sure that you're not taking too much? Uh, we uh, I showed you. We are now released. It's going to be I hope is. Uh, in, is uh, under revision in HPP, the series in which we show that nowadays it is uh, possible to standardize with the virtual cast 
the resection uh, before and uh, we uh, were able to estimate the future liver remnant uh, quite accurately. I showed a picture during my speech in which we did the death uh, and the, the future remnant uh, liver which was uh, calculated on the virtual cast was uh, 643 milliliter and at the end uh, the, the, the the real volume of the remaining liver was 630-73. So the approximation is quite good. Nowadays, this is a big advantage for us because exactly as you pointed out, the problem was how can we estimate the volume uh, in such a complexity? Nowadays, we can. We have the technology and every one of us has because it's at the virtual cast. Now we use the Fuji, but there are several assistants that can offer this kind of solution. Of course, the, you know, we have to schedule the operation before we decide the dissection plane. And sometimes uh, there is a, a variation intraoperatively, but uh, at least we know which is uh, the limit on other, you know, that we cannot pass. And one last quick question is, how valuable is, in your experience, the fusion ultra ultrasound, where you couple the uh, ultrasound with the CT scan? Uh, is that something that you use only specifically in certain cases or routinely? Hello. Uh, the problem is that the technology of the fusion imaging is not yet uh, uh, adequate for a perfect match. But uh, uh, for, so for now, I sometimes use uh, the probe in the hair to move the image of the CT and then uh, visualize the scanning of the liver and the position of the lesion in relationship with the glissonian pedicle and the hepatic vein. And then translate this image in the ultrasound uh, image. And then I catch the area uh, in the future, I'm sure that the possibility to match perfectly and move, let move the ultrasound and the CT image exactly in a, in a synchronous and symmetric way, that be, it could be realized. Already be realized. It's already realized. Unfortunately, as you know, Italy is not at the center of the world, so the technology is always important. And I have to wait at the second end of the technology. I have the idea at the first end, but the technology arrived at the second, third end. Then, uh, especially the Japanese technology. Um, then I, I, I am waiting for a, a, a new release of the fusion image that uh, is more able to match the, the, the two images of the preoperative imaging and the intraoperative ultrasound. For now, with the Italian fantasy, I can uh, anyhow manage because uh, you have to recognize the landmark. If you recognize the landmark, I mean the landmark vessel, and uh, you put in, in relationship the cluster of disease that you cannot see anymore with the landmark, you remove the area with a good approximation. Thank you, Guido. Thank you to you. Okay, now we have another uh, Italian, German Italian friend here, uh, uh, Professor Nadalini, are you here? I was, uh, we are expecting your comments. And the please... whole version of the Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Guido. Uh, hello to everybody, my friends, and it's a great pleasure to, to be with you. And it's so late time, it's half past 12 here in Germany like in Milano probably. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and it's difficult to find new questions after so many important so comments. Just one particular question is, in your vessel-guided surgery, you always speak about uh, portal and hepatic veins. What about the artery? Is the artery just because, you never mentioned this because the artery just followed the portal vein just because it's difficult? Or it's, it's just why? Uh, it's a, I mean, uh, it is easier for me 
in some parts, sometimes in some paper I wrote JP, GP, Grissonian pedicle, because I mean the Grissonian pedicle, not the vessel, the portal vein. It's simpler to say P58 rather than, but in reality I consider the prior. Uh, if there is the infiltration of the Grissonian and I cannot detach, I sacrifice the vessel. I do not dissect inside the liver the Grissonian pedicle. Sometimes I did, I do that. I did it uh, um, just uh, uh, last week. Uh, there was, uh, in the axilla, there was the infiltration of the axilla between the 5.8 and the 6.7. And at the end, uh, the tumor was not really detachable. It was a metastasis. And uh, not to shift to from a systematic extended right posterior to a right hepatectomy, I found that the bile duct can, can be spared uh, and uh, the contact was exactly faced to the portal branch. And then I just remove the glisson, the connective tissue of the glissonian, and uh, you know, just with the finger to see if there is, uh, uh, with ultrasound, just the vessel, the portal vein. I remove just the part of the connective tissue and I reconstruct by direct suture. And this was, but tendentially I do not like to enter in the design of medical, if not, uh, if I am not obliged to do that intra because the danger is too much to do something wrong, especially with it by that. So you can spare something, but in reality you ligate the, the bile duct and at the end of this part of the liver, it is so, it is, uh, it will be a source of more problem than, uh, than advantage. So tendentially, if there is infiltration, I don't do the best. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, second question, we are, so you are here in the arena of Alps friends and you are the <laughs> Western version of Mr. Nagino. Okay, you are, I, I don't say you are hate, uh, but you are not the best friend of it. And you demonstrated with your data, uh, comparing your procedure with the Italian Alps group that at least you have, if not similar, even better results than Alps procedure. So what about, ante situ, ex situ uh, operation. Is this procedure also better so, than this? Uh, uh, so the tunnel is the, the true alternative, the only alternative, you don't need any ante situ operation? Uh, I think that is a question of uh, cultural background. You know, I admit my limits. I have not done any cadaveric donor in my, in my life. Uh, and when I operate with a transplant surgeon, I notice the difference. A pure resective surgeon uh, is maniac on the opposite. He's less, uh, he's tried always to avoid to. And then I, what I did, it was just to maximize the possibility to avoid this uh, resection. And uh, during my, my, Presentation I show a case public published of a case which was done in anti situ, but it was clearly suitable for a liver tunnel because it was much smaller than a patient that we did, the more of the patient, most of the patient we did a liver tunnel. I, I think that uh, as for the Alps, probably there is a space, but if you apply a certain uh, policy, the number of ALPs or exit in view is much more limited than, than, than existing. Uh, but I also may say that uh, if, in example, you are, I mean, a, a transplant surgeon feel more confident to do an exit in view, why not? I'm not condemning. I mean, I try to, to spare because it's my attitude. <laughs> but if you feel more comfortable and more safer for you, for the patient, because you have more expertise in this approach, why not? Why not? I think uh, there is nothing, uh, nothing wrong. It's an opportunity. I think that uh, for me, in example, in our experience, 
of thousands of hypertectomy. We have never done a substitution of the inferior vena cava. And believe me, we have operated a lot of patients with heavily uh, uh, surrounded the inferior vena cava for cholangiocarcinoma. But I learned, and I, I published in Japan in 2001 on analysis surgery the experience of Makuchi. At the time, I was just his biographer. Uh, but I learned that, and I believe, I, I show in the, in the paper on analysis surgery, there is the picture of a patient that I challenge every one of you to consider a patient in which you can save the inferior vena cava. Believe me, it was saved in this patient. I saw the patient, I saw him operating, and I learned that, that with patients take time, the thoracofrenal apparatus, you spend millimeter by millimeter, but most of the time you reduce drastically the infiltration and you save the vein. But I understand also that a transplant surgery, that a surgeon that is very fast, very in, 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 in three minutes, cut the vein, substitute it, and it's finished. So there is nothing criminal in one sense and in the other. Uh, this is the nice aspect of being surgeon uh, together and discuss about it. But I, I respect this kind of approach. I have nothing to do. Uh, I just see, uh, and for now, I am essentially the minority, so I have to respect. <laughs> According to that, uh, the, my last question is, uh, so one technique is very good if it's uh, reproducible, you know. And uh, my question is, how many tortillas do we have in the Western world? Or how to become a widow too? Like, uh, Silvio, technically, my skill is very low. I consider myself not... Uh, may I stop just one, one, one? So ask, uh, so um, Orlando said, for example, oh, as I saw you, I went back and tried to do the tunnel. Maybe he was successful. I did one successful, I tried twice, and then I let it. So it's not that easy, uh, like, uh, so when we saw you, when I see you doing, uh, showing this data, I feel uh, myself like watching, uh, so Ronaldo playing uh, soccer, then I go to the soccer field and I'm not Ronaldo like you. So. How, how many people are really doing this, uh, this procedure? Silvio, the, 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 you know, to arrive to a tunnel is the result of an educational process of several years, as anything in the surgery, you know? And then, uh, and, and it's uh, following a direction, a path, according to the school, and the, the fantastic thing in liver surgery is that there are a lot of different schools. I belong to one school. And from that, I developed my, my way. And then it's small step by small step. And at the end, uh, I can do something which is my way. And I understand that uh, if I would try to do your way, I would have difficulty. It takes not one week probably several months, because I have to absorb all your tricks that are your tricks. And then uh, incision, use of left hand, uh, use of right hand, you know, everything is uh, a sort of uh, slow down uh, growing of a uh, way of thinking for every, every kind of surgery. But in example, my staff, I got them uh, when they were arrested, and they do the operation exactly like me. Some of them much better, and they are not uh, fantastic. There is no mandrake or uh, Spiderman or whatever. They are normal, normal, very good surgeon. I appreciate. I'm so happy to see them operating, but this means that uh, is. Uh, I may say, I was with Mapuchi the first time that I strabi. He changed with a younger guy because he was disappointed by my rough way of helping him. And objectively, my skill in comparison with them was very low. For luckily, surgery is not only the hands, it's also the brain, so and the combination. 
but it means that uh, everyone with application can arrive to do. It's just uh, the, fi the philosophy that you have to uh, absorb or not. You know, the main, I mean, uh, I think that the main difficulty is if you want to do a liver tunnel with the subcostal, in example, it's a problem. It's a real problem because your approach to the liver is exactly what you should know. It's a frontal approach and the deep is the tip. While the real, the real trick is if you want to do a, the, the tunnel, you have to make the deep, the surface, superficial. Then you have the full control. And nothing can happen. But to that, you need a, a, a certain kind of incision. And it's not totally the same. It's Makuchi that uh, was saying, Takayana, uh, all the Japanese guy. Uh, so we, I'm, not, uh, not, I'm not saying anything new. It's a combination. The, uh, the only thing that I had is with the Italian fantasy, someone invented the pizza and invented the tunnel. That's all. But, <laughs> but uh, the, potato, the potato came from the America, the tomato also, and the pasta <laughs> from China. <laughs> Thank you very much, Guido. Excellent. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Silvio. Uh, very nice to have you with us. Now I will ask Alan Contreras from Mexico, very uh, important surgeon from uh, Mexico. Please, Alan, let me invite you to make your comments and questions, please. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a fascinating talk every time I see it because, uh, as you said, the anarchists sculpture is really a great idea. And I have a question uh, regarding this. I have a couple of questions. So they look like a really enormous operation. Is there a limit uh, of what you can do when you are also working with the colorectal surgeons? I mean, uh, which cases would you say, I'm going to stop and I'm going to probably do everything at one time uh, in a second operation? And just specifically about this synchronic surgery. And in the other hand, it doesn't look to me that you have ever used either portal vein embolization or uh, uh, venous embolization to increase to for uh, further to a second step of surgery. Um, have you ever done it? Even or maybe when you are with the with the colorectal surgeons at the very beginning, how much is too much for this first operation? The other question I have is about um, enhanced construct. Uh, uh, contrast ultrasound. Apparently there is some research that uh, they could probably be beneficial to increase the power of detecting some lesions that are not seen in regular ultrasound, at least at least transabdominal. Uh, probably this is different when you are in the operating room. So have you ever used it? And, and, and my last question, um, what are your thoughts about the intra arterial pump for chemotherapy for these lesions. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, my friend, for the questions. I am old, I forgot the first. No, no, I tried to. <laughs> uh, I start with the last. I never use the intra arterial pump. Uh, I think that the chemo, systematic chemo is effective. I am afraid that probably uh, I saw that there is a uh, Karim and will be not against, against uh, their use expertise with interior interactivia, but I am always afraid to increase morbidity. And uh, the artery will want to stay patent without any travel, no carina inside. Uh, Synchronous, uh, uh, when you do a one stage, uh, we do a liver first approach. We generally don't do do not combine the colon unless uh, it uh, uh, remains symptomatic. We have no other chance, but at this point, uh, we do not reconstruct the colon. We demand the second, in the second operation. And uh, for the portal vein, of course, it's uh, very rare with you. We, we, we do the portal vein embolization for the class. For the class in tumor, of course that, or if we are really obliged to do a right, right. major hepatectomy, but uh, a major hepatectomy, when you do a major hepatectomy, most of the time it is because the liver that we have to sacrifice is almost open. 
occupied by the people. So it's not a question of volume. And think about it. The, I come from the school in which the portal venue is important. Sorry, I was listening to someone talking. And the last one, what about um, contract, const, uh, I'm ah. sorry, uh, contrast enhancer or something? Did you just use it or not? We, we, we were the first group that uh, started using in 2002 the contrast and asset interoperative ultrasound. At that time, there were no probes to do that. We used the, the percutaneous one. And nowadays, uh, we released the uh, the, the guideline in which there is also not I, but all the ultrasonographer in the world, and uh, me represented the, of the interoperative ultrasound, and uh, we use the contrast for the disappearing lesion, but it is not really uh, efficient in this sense. So it's much better to compare with the fusion image. And uh, uh, we used the ultrasound, uh, the contrast and asset for the multiple biloba isoricoid lesion. But if it is a steatotic tumor, uh, steatotic liver with hypoechoic lesion, there is already the contrast that is uh, uh, enough to recognize the lesion. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, let me ask uh, Professor Nicola Jarufi from Santiago a uh, very famous South American surgeon. Please, uh, Nicolas. Hi, hello everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very, very important meeting. I congratulate uh, Dr. Torsili for your great good talk. But uh, I have to say that uh, I agree, and probably this is the first time that I totally agree with Eduardo Fernandez, because uh, this is a very high-tech operation and very difficult. Uh, I know that uh, you, you said already that it's not uh, too difficult, but uh, we know that to follow all the inside anatomy of the liver is, uh, is a challenge. And uh, my, my question is, is, is it really worth doing that? I am the wrong person. Because uh, I know that yeah, but uh, for example, you have a, a lesion in the segment seven, and uh, to do a, a, a sector six and seven sectorectomy, anatomical six and seven, is much, much easier than do it just the only segment seven following your, your technique. And uh, we're, tra we're treating uh, normal livers, I mean, uh, livers without cirrhosis. It's true that have some damage because of the chemotherapy, but. Uh, all those liver we know that will re regenerate very well. So uh, why not to do sectorectomies, I mean six and seven, two and three, or right hepatectomy or left hepatectomy instead of uh, this very complex uh, anatomic resection that you do. And uh, this is my first comment. Second, you said something about uh, laparoscopic uh, liver resection. And you said that this is a, uh, incision uh, concern or incision problem and it's, it's not really an incision pro uh, difference because uh, uh, nobody, nobody there are uh, meta-analysis with more than 9,000 cases or 10,000 cases that shows that laparoscopic surgery is, is really safe. It's uh, even uh, safer than open surgery in terms of bleeding or uh, some kind of morbidity with the same uh, safe in terms of oncologic uh, results. So it's, it's, uh, to do a laparoscopic surgery is much easier to do a formal left, formal right, or formal right posterior, formal left lateral than to do the, your operation. So uh, again, my, my question and my comment, and I would like to, to hear from you, comments, is, is, is it really worth to do in this kind of operation instead of the formal resection? Thank you, Dr. Torsillo. Thank you to you. I almost disagree of, uh, about everything you said, but I, of course this is nice. Uh, can you remove certified lesion uh, selectively in laparoscopy? 
can you show me that uh, laparoscopy is uh, uh, the rescue of open surgery? Then it's a gradual uh, degree of uh, complexity. The border will depend on the cultural background, the school of surgery to which you belong, and uh, your challenging uh, kind of, but there will be always a border. <laughs> Unless uh, you will be able to do everything in life. Uh, this could be, but to now, there are three degrees. The border depends on the attitude, but there are the border. And the degree is minimal access, second, open access abdominal, third, open access thoracophrenic. There is also another one, minimal access abdominal and, thoracophrenic and chest. But it depends, the degree depends on the sensitivity of the surgeon, the skill of the surgeon, the trust of the surgeon, the way the surgeon live, look at the liver, and the, the purpose of the surgeon with the liver, and the kind of complexity you have the habit to, to operate. If I match my series with the, the series of a surgeon that does 70% of operation in laparoscopy, most of the patients have a complexity which is much lower because uh, the customer are different. To me, right, the patient who are, have been rejected by everyone else because I, you know, in, not voluntarily, but in the fact, became the reference for this kind of uh, customer or patient or whatever it is. Then the comparison, meta-analysis, whatever, I have seen tons of propensity scores in which to make comparable two series, you below the level of one, the, the below the level of a complexity of one branch, and then you can compare. But you are selecting a subset of patient of one group to compare with the other. And of course, for a certain profile of patient, I agree totally with you. you we do 15% of minimal values, minimal upper access. In terms of uh, then about the safety, I agree with you. Of course, there are just the incision is much safer and whatever. But you have to consider that when you push too much the laparoscopy out of the range, the complication of the patient after conversion of this subset of patients is worse than the patient directly afforded in open surgery. And the problem is also cultural. We have to consider yes, laparoscopy is, of course, a reality, exists, and is an established part of liver surgery. But we have to teach the young surgeon also to do the open surgery. First of all, because if they need to convert, they need to operate, to open the patient. And I see many young surgeons that <laughs> get confused when they have to open them. Uh, secondly, because uh, there are something, some aspects of liver surgery that can be done only in open surgery. Third, the, why I'm not doing a, a, a right posterior sectionectomy if I can do a segment seven? Because for me, it is not more difficult than segment seven, it's easier than a segment sectionectomy, and I can spare liver. Sparing liver, you leave the patient with more chance of being reoperated. Sparing liver is better than sacrifice uselessly. The liver because it's more it is easier for the surgeon. And I consider that a real left right posterior is more difficult than segment seven. Uh, with just the compression I do not need to go uh, anyway, this is a detail. Uh, I mean we are not doing surgery for something that can be offered with the right hepatitis. When I show the patient with 35 lesions bilaterally, there is no right hepatectomy for the patient. The solution is what we did. There is no other solution, even the ALPS. The only comparison can be done with the transplant. Then we have not to make confusion. If I show a slide with 35 lesions scattered everywhere, we cannot, I cannot receive, but why not the right hepatectomy? 
No, it means this patient is not operable. I, you know, the alternative is no surgery. And I see that most of you agree that uh, surgery is better than no surgery for colorectal liver cancer. Otherwise, it's better to stop this cancer. I mean, the oncologist would be happy, but I'm thinking that there is a wrong answer. For this patient, the challenge is the transplant. But once the transplant will prove to be uh, safer and better, then I will agree totally. No problem. I am not defending uh, whatever. I just claim the consideration of a kind of surgery that is very difficult. Everyone is saying that it's too complex. But why? It is the mortality with more complexity than the Alps, one-fifth the, 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 the mortality of the Alps, with, less comple with more complexity. Why we have only 0.8% of mortality? It is not more dangerous. And why we have a standard of safety which is quite similar to the Japanese. In the past, it was said, but because the Japanese patients are different than the Western patients. Now we do that in the Western patient, eh, because why? You have, I don't know what, what, what we invent to say that, ah, yes, the invention is, but you could not compare. The complexity is not equal. So find an agreement. Is more complex or is, or is less complex? If it is more complex, it is more complex, but it's safer. Objectively, if it is valid, the meta-analysis of laparoscopy versus uh, uh, open or the propensity score, why it is not valid in the propensity score and the case match among one stage and two stages? The methodology is the same. Paradoxically, I may say that we do not select the patient and the, and the average of our patients are more complex than, than the patient with the stage procedure. The problem is that such a kind of uh, comparison could be published only on digestive surgery because uh, there were reviewers that, uh, in, in, a, in a dogmatic way, they reject the idea even to think about this kind of surgery. Now we are not, but I'm sure that some young are, are going to be fascinated and probably, in part, some patient will receive this kind of surgery which can be done. The, the, the mean age of my staff is actually 39, but when they started were well, 36. Italian, in Italy, which is surgically a gerontocratic world, 36 uh, of a uh, mean age of the staff is a miracle. I started uh, using a knife at 36 years old because nobody was caring about so, I mean, this kind of surgery can be done, is safer because the rate of mortality is lower. So, if it would be so difficult and complex, I would expect worse results. Instead, we have good results. Sorry for getting me too excited, but, you know, I am tired because it's 20 years that I'm showing these results and I receive always too complex, too complex, too complex, but why we do not lose 10 patients every 100 operations? Why we use to lose less than one patient every 100 operations? And we operate, we have to find an agreement. Or we operate the easiest case, or it is not, uh, it is not too dangerous, the, the surgery. Yeah? The patient that you saw is a real patient, it's not a fake. And they are not... Uh, a giant uh, moving the hand uh, like an acrobat. Be sure, I'm normal, normal and normal. And I am safe. In Japan, when I trained my knotting compared to the other stuff, I was the number, the last one, the, the last. My skill was very poor. I'm not so, you know, pride or proud of my. It's a way of thinking. Believe me, it works. In Japan, it works and works also in, in the West. And if you just uh, uh, accept some, uh, without a dogmatic position, uh, some, uh, I understand, difficult to be accepted uh, perspective because they're totally different. The only difference in, it was when I was in Milan in the airport, my colleague moved to Bismuth or 
Pittsburgh, I decided to go uh, to Tokyo. <laughs> That's all. This is the difference. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. This is a good uh, discussion. But I know Nicholas loves laparoscopic surgery, and he's a great laparoscopic surgeon. Well, uh, let's, yeah, move. Let, let's move because we have only 20 more minutes, and I want to hear a few more colleagues. So, Alejandro Cerablo from Spain, thanks for joining us. A very experienced surgeon from the liver side. Thanks, Alejandro. Please uh, want to hear your comments. Complimenti Guido per la lettura. E buonanotte, e casi il bu buongiorno. Oggi non si no vivere come la ultima volta. Uh, well, uh, almost all, all questions have, uh, have been done because it's, uh, but I have um, two comments. Uh, I, I, I understand that when you speak about the uh, one resection, air, air vascular, air one vascular resection, you really speak about R1 concerning hepatic vein, not with the Gilsonian medical R1 resection. Huh? Well, uh -oh. I, I, I have uh, a question con, uh, in the multimetastatic liver, you use different protocol, the number of chemotherapy in the other case. For example, you, you look for the severe metastasis to diminish the charge of the tumor, of the low tumor in the liver, and to change the approach or not. My question uh, is, if you, with the chemotherapy, uh, look for the sapien metastasis too, or not? Yes, uh, for, uh, for the first question is, uh, we use the one vascular for the Gleasonian and the hepatic vein both. The, oh. the only difference is, uh, for the Gleasonian, if there is the infiltration, it would be better to cut the vessel. If there is just the contact, R1 is okay. R1 vascular, so the detach, but there should not be infiltration. So should be detachable. Uh, concerning uh, the, the other aspect uh, what, that you said, uh, the number we, of try, mm -hmm. we try to remove also the disappear rate. Uh, I also, if the patient is managed uh, from uh, by us together with the oncologist a priori initially we recommend if there are multiple tiny lesions to limit the neoadjuvant just to four cycles not six to, re to reduce the risk of but unfortunately most of the patients arrive uh, with uh, more than six because uh, they generally that the oncologists uh, are reluctant in considering surgery for this patient. Nowadays, uh, think about that the oncologists uh, uh, try to, they decide autonomously that the patient is not resectable and uh, they condemn the patient, I may say condemn, uh, to the maintenance protocols for years of chemo despite uh, if they consult a, a, a hepatobiliary pancreatic, we operate in most of the uh, uh, But in, 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 in operating theatre room, how manage uh, after this complex anarchy surgery, how, how you look, look for the sapien metastasis for EUS? No, we use the... Because it's very complex. It's very complex to localize the disappear metastasis in this very complex field of the liver. Yes. The, what we, no, no, we need the pre-chemo image. We upload the pre-chemo image on the ultrasound machine. And when, and we have beside the uh, pre-chemo and the ultrasound. ultrasound. And then we can match the relationship with the rest. And identify, recognize the cluster that has induced us to indicate surgery, including the, uh, the disappearing metastasis. And the last question, to, because it's very late for us, um, yeah. what is the, the play of the role, the radio frequency of microwave into your kind of surgery? Because maybe it's mm, use the radio frequency of microwave could be to converse easy surgery instead of very complex? Uh, 
uh, we use the microwave uh, or the radio frequency according to intraoperatively in the event we have a lesion in which uh, is isolated and deep. And the ratio between the liver that you have to sacrifice and the size of the lesion is totally unfavorable. In consideration of the lesion, that the area that you have already removed. Then in this sense, for safety, we just, uh, I mean, uh, we just uh, ablate the lesion. Of course, must be lesion less than two centimeters diameter. It means small lesion deep into the liver, in the renal liver, we ablate, we do not resist. Okay, okay, thank you very much, uh, Guido. He did uh, very well. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. We have only 10 more minutes, and I want to hear two uh, very prominent surgeons that are here with us tonight. And my, my neighbor here from Argentina, uh, Lucas McCormick, a very famous Argentinian surgeon. Uh, Lucas, please uh, let us yes. hear your comments and uh, questions. Thank okay. You Thank you. Good night to everybody. Thanks for the invitation, Eduardo. And, and we don't like your, I love your, your concept. You know that. So I have a practical questions because I have a, what, what we taking a little bit the, the idea of Silvio at the beginning saying that what do you advise? We are not Guido, everybody, so it's difficult for many of us to, to go for this approach. And the first question is sometimes we don't have this software that you just mentioned that you integrate the ultrasound with the CT during the operation. And sometimes it's very difficult because the liver is fatty, there are some chemo before, so it's very difficult to isolate the lesion with the ultrasound during the surgery. So would you advise us, that we are liver surgeons who are doing ultrasound, and you are very skilly with the ultrasound, but not everybody of us, would you advise to put some metallic stuff inside, something to localize this better during the surgery? or Because sometimes we feel that this is it's very difficult to find them and maybe it's easier to resect more liver instead of going for the approach that you are proposing. This is the first uh, one. Well, maybe just well, answer, answer you. Well, uh, I see that there is a, 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 a bit of misunderstanding. I mean, uh, there is, a, according to all of the questions that I received, uh, the mismatch between uh, the highly complex procedure that I show, without considering the kind of tumor invasion that that patient had, for which there was no other solution according to the conventions. But of course, if we have less tumor bar and uh, you do not feel confident with the complex uh, section to spare the uh, liver whenever you have the possibility to enlarge the section. I think uh, you, every one of us, every one of you, has to follow the attitude for the safety of the patient, not challenging something uh, too complex when it does not deserve. But in the patient that I show, it was the oblique way, otherwise there was no rejection. It was to show you where you can go with this kind of approach. But it was not showing you the standard operation for a standard presentation. No? Then, uh, given that uh, I think uh, that, uh, of course, if you, it's not a crime to remove more liver if you do not feel uh, comfortable with the dissection. Uh, the problem is, if you want to uh, follow this kind of approach, you have to take the entire package. The entire package means uh, not only the ultrasound, it means uh, a lot of other tricks which are indispensable, especially when you start. 
once you get expertise, you will you will you will cre create your path. And probably some of the tricks that uh, nowadays are used uh, will be eliminated because uh, you find another way off. But uh, to do a kind of surgery like this, I think uh, the decision should be done accordingly and uh, whatever. I understand that it's this difficult to do that for an established surgeon. I am not asking to the established surgeon to change their own modality. I'm not such a stupid. I am just saying consider this policy, accept the, this policy as a the policy which has its, its own dignity and it's one of the options. That's all. Then after, please, everyone has to do what is in his uh, own uh, background. According to the uh, preoperative uh, metallic uh, landmark, we do not use but I accept, you know, if I do not use because I don't like to do uh, invasive uh, procedure before the, of the operation, not to, to increase the morbidity. And uh, in second line, because uh, with this technology, we can think about the technology I'm talking about. It is just an ultrasound system. Eh? It's not a uh, you know, highly expensive uh, uh, instrument. Eh? It's very easy. There are several a company that release it and it's quite cheap compared with the usual uh, device that we use in the OR. Totally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, we have uh, only five more minutes and uh, it's always a great pleasure to have you uh, around. Let me ask the, late, the latest uh, debater, Professor Karim has a loan from New York. Karim, are you there? Hi, sorry I was late, Guido. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Eduardo. I was in the OR, so I, I, I fucked up the timing. In all honesty, with the use of profanity here, I'll tell you that I, I was late. I'm sorry. Guido, you know I love your surgery, whether it's roller coaster surgery or anarchist surgery or surfing through the liver or a falling tree and branches, any way you describe it. I, I don't think I have more many Silvio really asked my main question followed on by Lucas I'm going to ask a few questions and have some comments I think it's unfair to call it non-complex it's complex for all of us except you and all of us are relatively experienced liver surgeons with different variation of skills and whether you think you're unskilled or not what you're doing is complex it's also unfair to compare it to Alps and I'm not an Alps person you know, surgeons are relatively simple and they like to go in straight lines. And Alps is generally going in a straight line. It's not doing what you're doing. You're not going in a straight line. And that makes people's minds a little bit discombobulated. And it's very hard to teach. And one of the things that I'm, I, I ask you is how do you teach it? I mean, we all want to come and learn it from you. I think we can try and teach ourselves and pretend like we know what we're doing. But the reality is you spent years educating yourself about this and you became a master at it and for us to become masters at it we have to change the way we think i agree with that we have to think away move away from straight lines but that's a commitment that needs a lot more than just time many of us will see patients with 38 lesions and say they're unresectable you'll say bring it on so we need to learn that um my questions are threefold really one is, what do you tell the patient? You know, in the States, we have a very litigious culture and telling the patient that I'm going to leave tumor behind on their vessels, but it's going to be okay because it's the same as not leaving tumor behind is a little bit complicated culturally to explain to these patients. And it's, it's very difficult to get it through to them to say, it's okay, you have, I'm going to leave tumor, there's going to be a positive margin, but don't worry about it, it's okay. So that's one. Number two is really, I understand you have a staff that you train, but if you train them in your technique of this surfing roller coaster, whatever you want to call it, do they actually know how to do what we call anatomical resections, but you, you think are maybe non-parenchymal sparing surgery? And how do you get them from one mindset to the other mindset? And lastly, I think this question was already asked because I walked, I came in on the discussion, but 
really, you're, I want to know which patients you're sending for transplants. If you can take out 38 lesions, right, who's unresectable for you, right? And if, 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 if we're saying Guido Torsili is unresectable, N is one out of 100, right, or for us, it's much higher, you know, aren't you really the person who's positioned to do the only randomized trial and actually randomize patients to transplant versus a torsiliectomy? Uh, it could be, it could be nice to uh, randomize like this. Uh, of course, the patient with unresectable exit. Uh, those patients which uh, you cannot recognize a cluster. Uh, the secret is to recognize the possibility to find group to group the lesions, and then. Uh, in this way and find the way to make together the maximum number of lesions in a one single resection area. We do not do 20, uh, 35 resection area. We do three, four resection area. But we try, try to find out a way to concentrate. When this is not suitable, it means that the patient is unresectable and they exist. I mean, say today I've seen two patients like this. Last week, also three patients that I sent to, if possible, to the transplant. Um, concerning, this is the, the, the one question. The second question is, uh, I don't remember the second question. What do you tell the patient? Ah, yes, uh, of course. The, my, my visits, uh, the check of the patient is uh, lasting, uh, the average is one and a half hour. Uh, I discuss uh, uh, a lot. I explain the pro and cons of the stage procedure of the R1 vascular surgery, telling them the results of the literature, it's nothing more than that, nothing less, and giving them uh, the pros and cons. And unfortunately, you know, if you say the pro and you say the recurrence rate is the same, the possibility to reoperate is threefold higher. The possibility of die and one fifth lower. The possibility of recurrence of R1 vascular compared to the R0 is uh, almost the same. So please decide yourself. Nowadays, uh, this is the way. The patient is uh, driven, and normally uh, they have to decide. And uh, they don't have to decide uh, in front of me. They have to think, uh, consult uh, any other second opinion, whatever. But I am telling just the truth. The truth is the results what I what I have had, and uh, uh, of course, any one of us has his own personal opinion. I try not to put my personal opinion. I just try to put the data, and, and this is the nice aspect of uh, being a, an academic surgeon, uh, which is not so usual, especially in my country. But uh, data, data, and objectivity, and explain to the patient which is the project. Uh, this, this is the way, I think, uh, it may work also in the United States, I know, I, I know. Um, it's different, different modality, but uh, be, be sure, one and a half hour per patient, uh, there are not so many my colleagues that do that, <laughs> so it's uh, unusual, but it, you have to do so, I think I do like this, and normally, the patient are com at least compared to the what they receive from the oncologist or the, the consent informed consent that the, they are released, at least in my count. The oncologist does not expect anything about the future. They say, just let's do that and we will see, we will see, we will see. The patient arrived to us with a lot of we will see. We use not to say we will see. We, we don't say never you will die in six months, but we will say the rate of uh, uh, survival at five years is uh, 35% if you have more than four lesions. Uh, but you know, you are, you know, you try to, to, to let the patient look at the most positive aspect, but at the end, you will tell to the patient what he needs to know. And uh, about the one vascular, 
objectively, there are the data. Of course, it's a monocentric. Everything, everything that we do in surgery is always uh, amenable of being critical, uh, you know, critically, uh, crit critically observed. Uh, it is a monocentric uh, experience with a lot of numbers. Uh, I am sure that in the future there will be more other centers to be do that. Probably may, maybe if someone will do a randomized trial, and I hope so. Uh, this is the fatigue when you start something new, always more centric. Then at the end, it uh, becomes something more. The, most, the, the higher difficulty is uh, that uh, behind me, there is uh, just a philosophy, culture, and uh, human power. No technology, no business. There is no company interested in pushing this kind of surgery. It may seem something, uh, but it's, uh, it's important to do. Uh, uh, this is my main concern. I would not see my kind of uh, kind of surgery that we we try to develop dying because of uh, the the lack of business. This would be disappointing. I don't think so. I think it'll only die if transplant is really proven to be better. Yeah, yeah. But this then you have to learn how to cut the vena cava. <laughs> I cannot do the transplant. So. <laughs> You know, in Italy, you need the permission. Well, guys, uh, that you know, we we are here for two hours and twenty minutes, and it's it's great to have uh, friends from all over uh, the world. We have uh, uh, we have people here from Europe, from South America, North America, uh, two friends from Angola in Africa. Uh, unfortunately, the Chichi Wang, my friend from Taiwan, he couldn't, uh, he was not able to, to join us. But anyhow, uh, there was a great discussion. I have friends from Brazil, from, from different parts, from different parts of the country. So I appreciate everybody. And I, I want to thank again Guido for this great talk. It's a great discussion. We could be here for five, six hours discussing. This is a very wild topic so Guido it's one in the morning I guess one and almost 1 30 in the morning in in Milan so, so we really appreciate your kind attention and our friendship uh, I also want to thank all my colleagues from Brazil uh, my friend Orlando Fabio uh, Cristiano from from Cleveland Karim from New York and everybody else so we're going to finish. And again, thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, that soon we're going to organize another Zoom meeting and all of us will be our guests. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Guido. Really? Thank you. I really thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.